I'd like you to turn your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read the first 14 verses. By the way, I'm using the Bible that True Direction gave me this morning. Uh, they I gave me this like uh, 25 years ago or so, when, or 28 years ago when I went in the Navy and we had our farewell. And uh, just felt like using, using that uh, very special Bible to me. God's Word says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he pur purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. How many of you used to watch Roy Rogers and Dale Evans in the movies? How many of you watched originally when they broadcast the TV shows back in the mid-50s. How many of you watched the, the reruns of the TV shows in the 70s? They played them up until the early 70s. Was there any of the younger folks who watched those? How many of you have no idea who I'm talking about? Okay. <laughs> and imagine if I asked this with the junior high kids who just went to help with... with uh, with junior church, uh, children's church. But uh, the reason I bring them up, by the way, my brother and I had many a great argument about who was the better cowboy. I thought it was Roy Rogers. He thought it was Hopalong Cassidy. I still have his Hopalong Cassidy watch. Neither one of us voted for Gene Autry. And actually, Roy Rogers was the best rider of all of them. He actually could ride full gallop and do all those things. I saw him in person at the uh, old Madison Square Garden when I was about seven years old, and he just came galloping into that arena going about 50 miles an hour, full gallop, stopped on a dime, reared up, and, and got off the horse in an instant. He really could do that stuff. In fact, his son Dusty, or Roy Jr., said that he and his, he and his mom Dale, Roy Sr. and his mom Dale were on TV, they were like they were in person. They were like they were on TV and in the movies, except they didn't shoot anybody. <laughs> Anyhow, why do I bring them up? Last week, um, we had Wayne Wearsma here from Bethany Christian Services. And of course, for decades now, um, Bethany Christian Services has been involved. It's been one of the most wonderful organizations in adoption. Uh, the, the primary uh, organization for adoption for those Christian couples looking to adopt 
either in America or from overseas. I have many friends who've adopted through Bethany Christian Services, and it's a tremendous ministry. Well, Roy Rogers married his first wife, Arlene, in 1936. That was before I was born. And she died after giving birth to their only son, Roy Jr. Arlene and Roy had two daughters, one they adopted named Cheryl, and one that they had along with Roy Jr. named Linda Lou. Roy Rogers married Dale Evans on New Year's Eve in 1947. Together they had a daughter, Robin, born with a heart defect and Down syndrome, who died just a few days before her second birthday. In fact, Dale Evans wrote a book about that. Anybody know what the name of the book was? Angel Unaware. Angel Unaware. Beautiful book. Book that was given to my mom and dad after my brother was killed in a car accident, even though the circumstances of the loss of the child were, were totally different. Um, it really resonated with my mom and dad to, to read that beautiful account of, of uh, Robin, Robin's life. In the 1950s, Roger, they adopted four more children known as Dodie, Sandy, Marion, and Debbie Lee. And they were struck by tragedy more than once. Uh, Debbie died in a church bus accident. I remember this. And, Around 1964, they had a bus going through the hills of, of Colorado, I think, and they were headed for Mexico. I know that. They were headed for Mexico for a mission trip, and the bus driver lost control, and, and she was one of the ones who died. And then Sandy, Sandy was a, a young man with learning disabilities. He went in the Army. He qualified to go in the Army, and he allowed himself, like many young people do, he allowed himself to be talked into getting drunk, and he got so drunk he never woke up. You can imagine what a tragedy that was to them. But adoption, that's our topic for today. The love of adoption. I believe most of us know this, but did you know if you're in Christ, you're all adopted? You're all adopted into God's family. None of us is naturally, we're all in the family of God in the sense of being, being made in his image, but none of us are in the family of God just by being born physically. Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be born from above. If you're born, of the, you must be born by the water, which is physical birth, and you must be born of the spirit, which is new birth in Christ. And when we're born again, we're adopted. One of the amazing things that happens is we become adopted children. Adopted children into the family of God. And because of that, we have all the same blessings. And I've shared this a little bit about this with you before, but isn't it amazing? We have all the blessings that only who deserves? Jesus. Our Savior. We receive all the blessings that only He deserves as God the Son. And because we are adopted as God's sons and daughters into His family, we gain all those blessings, all those riches that Paul calls in the scripture we read, the riches of His grace, that He, he doesn't just give us the riches of His grace, but the Word of God says, he lavishes them. He lavished them upon us. What's that mean? We had a, for our family, we had a pretty lavish celebration for our 40th anniversary. Uh, Bruce Bemis made a big roast on, on the spit, you know, a big roast beef on the spit. I don't know how much spit he used, but it sure tasted good. And, you know, that thing went around and around, and, and that was delicious, and our daughter made... I think like four big baked hams in our oven and our son-in-law made uh, these delicious barbecue chicken wings that probably had more calories than I even want to think about. And that food, it was lavish. It was, I thought the food was going to be enough for us to last us a week, even after everybody went home. Well, there was a little bit of leftover, but I'll tell you, the 70 people or so that came ate pretty good. 
They ate lavishly from a lavish banquet. And that's what Jesus, that's what God brings to us. He brings a lavish blessing if we're open to it. If we're open our hearts to him as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ. If we say, Lord, speak to my heart. Teach me how great the blessings are that I have in you. Teach me what it is like, what it means for me to be adopted by grace through faith into your family. We have a dear brother in Christ, uh, Kevin Cross, one of the children of George Cross, who's been a, for years was a faithful part of our church. He goes to East Brookfield Baptist Church and if I had a son and he was preaching in East Brookfield every Sunday, that's where I'd be too. But Kevin and his wife Linda, they've adopted how many? Eight or nine? They had two of their two or three of their own. They adopted eight or nine. What a heart. That, now I think that takes a special gift to be willing to adopt eight or nine and deal with all the problems that those children bring in from their backgrounds. But I know that there are Christians, we're adopted into God's family. Maybe some of us need to spend some time praying. Is there something God wants me to do? Is there a child out there who needs a home that I could provide? Either through adoption or temporary foster care, which is both available through Bethany Christian Services. If we want to be imitators of Christ, we actually we have to at least ask him the question, is this something you want for me? You adopted me. Should I be doing something? Am I at a place in my life where, where I could help a child who otherwise their life might never know about the love of Christ? If Christians adopt and bring foster children into their homes, they're going to grow up at least hearing the message of Christ. Now, does that mean they're all going to receive him? No. We have teenagers in our families, right, who grew up hearing the message of Christ, and some of them have accepted it, and some of them have pushed it away. And that's up to them. We cannot make our children's choices for them. But when we realize that through Christ... We are adopted into his family. What are some of the blessings we get? Look at, verse, look at verse 7. In him we have redemption. We're brought back through his blood. The forgiveness of sins. We're not accountable for our sinful lifestyles and the bad choices we've made before we came to Christ and since we've come to Christ. It's all washed away at the cross of Jesus Christ. And so we receive redemption, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of his grace that he did what? He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will. Now that word mystery is an interesting word. In fact, in Greek, we get our English word mystery from the Greek word mysterion. Sounds pretty familiar, right? And... Now, you have to understand, sometimes we hear about these new Gospels they've discovered, the Gospel of Thomas, and now there's this big report out by, a, I think, a Harvard professor about what she calls the Gospel of the Wife of Jesus. This, this Gospel, this portion of paper she found is from about eight or 900 AD. There's no proof that it ever existed before that. We have portions of the Gospel of Matthew that date back to about 40 or 50 AD. That's new, by the way. We have portions of the Gospel of John. John wrote around 90 AD. We have portions from around 110 AD. And they all match up with what we have of the complete Gospels. These so-called Gospels are part of the mystery religions and the other things that came out of Christianity. They weren't rejected because a bunch of people got together 400 years after Christ lived and died, and according to the liberal scholars, they, the disciples thought he was raised from the dead. Okay, They, they imagined he was raised from the dead. They believed he was raised from the dead. But we know nobody really raised him from the dead, so we can't believe that. So we have to discount 
every little portion of scripture that hints at miracles, because we know miracles don't happen. That's the liberal scholar approach to looking at the word of God. If, if Jesus performed a miracle, that's not part of the original gospel. The things that Jesus said, some of them that are nice and mushy and gushy, they're part of the original gospel. If Jesus says something about hell, that's not part of the original gospel because we know Jesus was loving and kind. Well, anyhow, the, the thing about the mis- these mystery religions, they formed scriptures that were for small groups and they were rejected not by leaders of the church. They were rejected by all the church for hundreds of years if they came. Up. That's why we have so few copies of them. The church said, no, that doesn't ring true. The Gospel of Thomas, I think it is, where Jesus, he's playing with a friend, and he doesn't like what the friend does, so he turns him into a frog. Is that the Jesus of the New Testament? No, that's the Jesus of the mystery religions and the Gnostics. And to them, the mystery was something that only a very few select people could understand. You with me? The mystery of the mystery religions and the Gnostics was there were special people like swamis or something who had the higher knowledge. And so they could understand the mysteries of God. Now, when, when God's word uses the word mystery, mysterium, he's not saying something we can't understand. He's talking about something that people didn't really expect as Jesus the Messiah came. They expected Jesus. What did Judas expect from Jesus? Expected him to come and take over. Take over from Rome, throw out all the Roman Empire, all the Roman legions, and Israel would be Israel, and he'd be the Messiah, and everything would be fine. They didn't see Isaiah 53 about the suffering servant applying to Jesus. They missed that. That's the mystery. The mystery is the the miracle of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and then the joining of Jews and Gentiles into the body of believers. The mystery is that now Jews and Gentiles are all part of one body in Christ that we call the church. Because we have been adopted into one family. If you look a little further down the passage here, you were also, verse 13, you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. See how personal the gospel is? He doesn't just say, some passages say the gospel of salvation, or the gospel of the kingdom, but this says the gospel of your salvation and my salvation. Paul wants to make sure they know it's personal. Worship is corporate, the body of Christ worshiping, but salvation is person to person, the person of Christ coming into the person of Ken Winters, into my heart, into your heart. And so he says, you were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Having believed, you were marked with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Now, we know that when Jesus was placed in the tomb, what was the last thing after the the rock was stoned in? rock was rolled in front of the tomb. What's the last thing that happened? Sealed. It was sealed with the Roman seal, which was a promise that that tomb was never going to be opened. That was a Roman government promise, okay? That it would never be opened. And, of course, God had other ideas. Amen? And so, you see... We're marked with a seal, but God gives us this seal, and this seal can never be taken away. It's the seal of the Holy Spirit upon our hearts, which is a a promise or a deposit, a guarantee. You could even use this word to mean engagement.
engagement or betrothal. Who are we in Christ? We're the bride of Christ. Now, we haven't had the marriage supper of the Lamb yet, but before Mary and Joseph were joined in marriage, the, uh, the angel appears to Joseph and says, Joseph, um, don't be afraid to take unto you Mary as your wife. And it says, and Joseph, before that it says, and Joseph, her husband, they're betrothed. They're engaged, but betrothal was a lot deeper thing. You and I are betrothed with the bride of Christ. And when he returns for us, we're going to experience the marriage supper of the Lamb, and it's going to be beyond our imaginations. Now, when a Christian mom and dad, whether they already have their natural children or not, adopt through a group like Bethany, it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? It's just one of the most precious things I can imagine. We have people in our church who've adopted. Pauline Dwelly and Ralph. Um, Madge and Andy aren't here today, but Madge and Andy Dumpty, they've adopted. I don't know who else has had adopted children in our midst. But what a beautiful and powerful message to say, I love you enough to give you a home. I love you enough to give you a place of safety and a place of security and a place of learning and instruction. I love you enough to take you up in my arms even though you are not mine. That's what God's done for us. If you turn to Romans 8, we're going to close with this. Just a portion of this. God's word says, In verse 28, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, I would add. Those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? And then God's word says that because of what Jesus has done for us, we can call God Abba, which means Papa. It's not the formal name Father. It's like me calling my dad, Dad, which is what I called him because we were so close. Um, He was my father, but I called him dad. Because we're adopted into the family of God, we can call God the Father, Abba, just like Jesus could. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Abba, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So just like Jesus could talk personally to God the Father, so can you and I because we're adopted and we have all the inheritance that Jesus deserves. Let's pray. What a good thing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. You do the best things. You made this incredible universe, which is, seems endless when we look at it through telescopes and, and all the rest. Seems endless as we look outward and it seems fathomless as we look inward to the cell and to the body. And with all this great power, you love us. And you've made all the provisions for us to be adopted into your family. So thank you. Lord, help us by the power of your Holy Spirit that guarantee, that deposit in our lives of what's going to come in heaven and when the new heaven and the new earth is established at your return. Lord, help us to allow that the Holy Spirit life, the Jesus life, to shine through us and to touch the lives of family and friends. Here in town, wherever we live, wherever we go, may we live to the praise of your glory. 
in Jesus' name.